Thank you. Thank you, Madam Christel. Thank you so much. Uh, first and the foremost, a huge thanks to IRP for, for allowing me to be part of this, uh, this event today and, and also to be part of such a distinguished panelist. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you all know, uh, right five, exactly five weeks after the adoption of the Sendai framework and the UN World Conference on DRR in Sendai, our country, Nepal, experienced the largest earthquake ever experienced by our generation. Uh, this was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake with massive extent of, of damage, um, mainly in the central part of the, of the country. Uh, more than 800, 8 million people were affected. Uh, the economic uh, damage and loss amounted to be more than $7 billion. Uh, more than 8,000 people died and an extensive damage of infrastructures, schools, uh, private houses, uh, but also other, other infrastructures, monuments. Uh, and so, so it really kept, made a huge blow to, to Nepal's economy um, and, and thus, uh, next slide please, and thus the need for uh, a design, reconstruction and recovery process. Uh, soon later in 2017, uh, the government of Nepal uh, then enacted the Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act. Uh, it was very much uh, influenced by the, the Sendai framework as well. Uh, it, it does focus into the risk reduction uh, arena, but also captures uh, pillar four, especially in terms of reconstruction and recovery. Uh, and, and following that, we, we've also come up with Nepal's DRR policy and its strategic action plan. I particularly want to draw your attention on the strategy action plan, especially on the next slide, please, uh, which, uh, which, which imbibes the four priority pillars uh, as stipulated by the Sendai framework. Uh, it's, it's grounded on the Nepali context, uh, but if, it, uh, if when we have identified those priorities, especially in line with, with the Sendai framework, uh, the activities and the the targets are, are exactly in tune with the Sendai framework, but it's tuned into, into the Nepali ground conditions. Uh, next slide, please. And, and now reflecting back on the midpoint through since the 2015 uh, adoption of the Sendai framework, what we see is, uh, is the biggest set of learning, especially in terms of the earthquake reconstruction and recovery, which started with a post-disaster needs assessment uh, that was supported by, by a lot of international partners uh, and also a uh, lot of ministries and in, uh, interministerial committee formed for undertaking the PDNA. Uh, there was a, a international conference on Nepal's reconstruction that took place in June 2015. Uh, we received overwhelming support from the international development partners, international uh, neighboring countries, and also other countries around the world, uh, Japan being one of those four first and the foremost uh, for uh, strong commitments for, for supporting Nepal's reconstruction and recovery. Next slide, please. To take it forward, um, the, uh, the government of Nepal then came up with a post-disaster risk uh, recovery framework that identified the financing figures for each of the sectors, but also more importantly, it identified uh, the roles and responsibilities for each of each of the agencies that were tasked to do under tasked to undertake the reconstruction and recovery. Next slide, please. So. So what I'd like to do is, is build on two areas of reconstruction and recovery, especially for today's event. One on the successes and the lessons from the earthquake reconstruction and recovery. And then secondly, building on the experience of, of the National Reconstruction Authority that are set up after the earthquake uh, and this last six years, how we've, we've tried to imbibe the same lessons and learn, learnings and further enhance in terms of, again, reconstruction and reco recovery, especially from other set of hazards, especially monsoon floods, landslides, fires, including forest fires. This has been a recent development. Uh, so on to the next slide, please. Uh, so next slide. Especially looking at the, the reconstruction, what we've seen is, um, is uh, through structural integrity assessments, we've realized that our educational facilities, including other critical infrastructures, uh, were, uh, were not actually designed to withstand such large earthquakes. So a massive extent of damage uh, in schools, uh, but fortunately we've been able to kind of build, uh, build nearly 6,000 schools, again, again imbibing on the, the principles of build back better, but also looking at future 
requirements of our school buildings. These are, these are much be better design facilities now. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, uh, some schools are now have like universal access des designs, uh, especially for buildings that are, are single floor. This is a unique case of where, where even a, a two-story buildings have been designed with using accessibility considerations. Next slide, please. Uh, Huge learning, especially in terms of retrofitting of school buildings as well, as not all the school links, uh, buildings were, were completely damaged. Next slide. Uh, so we could see some of those schools, hundreds and hundreds of, of children are, are now oh, studying in, in, a, in a much better facility that would withstand future, future shocks such as, such as earthquakes, but also other disasters. Next slide. Uh, under the picture of schools, uh, we could see the, the, the extensive number of children that are housed in, in these, these schools. Uh, next. Uh, not only schools, but also health facilities have been, have been reconstructed. Uh, next slide. In the interest of time, I'm gonna flip uh, to second slide as well, public, public buildings as well, including security, uh, security offices, the army, the police. Uh, next slide, please. And these were, uh, these were constructed using, again, uh, a revised building code uh, that, that did follow the Build Back Better uh, principles. Now, the biggest set of learning for us was, came from the reconstructing on the private housing, uh, where it, nearly 800,000 houses have, have been rebuilt, and it's considered one of the success stories, especially in terms of undertaking uh, private housing reconstruction. Well, that's a success story, but we've also had some, um, some experiences as well. And so building all on these experiences, especially constructing and recovering, uh, we've now, especially within the last two years, uh, ever since the setting up of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority, we've, we've now used the lessons from the National Reconstruction Authority and the Earth, Earthquake Reconstruction into designing reconstruction and recovery programs for families and, and houses, and including structures affected by the floods, landslides, fire, and forest fires. Next slide, please. What we also noticed is, is these kind of disasters are kind of spread along the, throughout the whole country. Next slide, please. It, it marks some of those distract disasters. Uh, so these are, these are the progresses made in, in terms of reconstructing uh, these private houses. Next slide, please. One key fact that I would want to kind of highlight to this August gathering today is, is some of these settlements that have been there for centuries are now not able to continue living in, in these kind of settlements. This settlement, what we see in the left-hand picture is, is, has been there for centuries and now with flooding and with aggradation of riverbeds and massive amount of you know, sediment, particularly triggered by high extreme amount of rainfall uh, attributed to climate change, these settlements are now rendered uh, unfit for settlements, and so this is where this is where the need to resettle these uh, these uh, historic settlements to other safer areas is is a challenge, uh, and this is this is a story of one particular village in in the mid and far west region of Nepal. But this is what we've 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 experienced that has increased massively over the last uh, last two years. Extensive damages by particularly from landslides, floods, uh, aggradation of river systems. The recent one uh, being uh, a wiping out of, uh, of a major interbasin transfer of water water supply project being supported by ADB, a multi-billion dollar uh, million dollar project is now um, is is really kept kept into a complete halt. So that's the extent of again climate change uh, impacts that we're experiencing in, in such a mountainous country in, in Nepal. So the challenge for us lies in again again imbibing the principles of build back better, but also leaving no one behind. And when we do such kind of uh, resettlements into safer places, but also reconstructing these these infrastructures. Uh, next slide, please. So, so some of the key lessons that we've learned is especially from both the National Reconstruction Authority's experiences and and our recent experiences is that uh, despite the political transition again. Uh, uh, there's there's a huge uh, huge pressure for 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 government to really uh, disperse single trans for reconstructing and, and reconstructing some of these private houses. Uh, it doesn't work, and so what we've realized is doing it in three tranches, having proper control mechanisms, especially for quality controls, for for adopting building building codes, for adopting um, leaving no one behind principles, but also bringing in the concepts of, again, addressing the needs for, uh, for persons with disabilities are such a challenge, such a, such a challenge thing that we need to address it. Uh, 
doing reconstruction recovery in far off remote places that have very little infrastructure is, is, is a huge challenge, uh, but also uh, the human resources capacity is also equally challenging. Uh, huge investments needs, needs to be done, especially in terms of building capacity of, of engineers, masons, local elected governments. Uh, but we've also experienced, again, uh, undertaking reconstruction recovery in urban settings is even more challenging than the ones in, in the rural, rural areas. Uh, on the next slide, please. So the messages that, that we take away from the 2015 earthquake is that despite all the challenges, again, with strong determination and political leadership and a strong consensus building, uh, and particularly driven by a huge mobilization of local communities, we've been able to achieve this success. Uh, and this was only possible, this was possible through the support of again numerous development partners, including NGOs and INGOs in, in the country. And having a, a an autonomous entity such as the National Reconstruction Authority with legal mandates really helped drive this process. Uh, needless to say that again, uh, Build Back Better principles really helped us in terms of really looking into the future shocks um, in terms of designing the settlements, houses and infrastructures. But one of the key success behind this, uh, this fast track reconstruction is the owner driven reconstruction process where the financial disbursement took place directly into the beneficiary's account. And this is where a stronger feeling of resilience and the process to learn how, how, these, uh, how to get money, how to get these processes being done. Uh, We've, we've also been, uh, been pretty much considerate on in terms of again, leaving no one behind uh, when, when targeting the poorest of poor and the most vulnerable, such as the persons with disabilities. It's still a huge amount of work needs to be done. Uh, next, on the, on to the next slide, please. And so the way forward for us uh, is, is many folds, but especially I'd like to highlight five key lessons uh, is uh, especially on, on going forward the disaster resilient development has to be an integral component of the national development agenda, uh, without which our investments could, could be wiped out, like, like in the cases that we've seen, seen ahead. Uh, issues such as NDRMA and uh, NRA, with special legal authority and financial and human resources are so much required. Uh, and, and to establish and strengthen DRMA institutions and systems at all levels of governance is, is so much important. Uh, we need to work with local governments because they are the ones who are at the far forefront in terms of really integrating these risk considerations and multi-hazard risk considerations into, into future planning. Uh, fourth, on the systematic planning, the implementation and monitoring framework for, for disaster resilience, such as the one in national strategy. Uh, we're planning to come up with a national disaster resilience framework by 2030, 2030 in line with the Sendai, Sendai framework. And, and for us going forward also requires scaling up in our, the National Reconstruction Authority's reconstruction and recovery learnings into a, a scale into other districts and areas which were not affected by, by the earthquake itself. So these are the key lessons that are very much built on our experiences for the last six years. And it's, it's interesting to note that it coincides with the kind of halfway through of the adoption of the Sendai framework. Uh, so with this, I'd like to stop my presentation and pass it Pass, pass this floor back to back to the back to our moderator. Thank you so much.